On behalf of Steve Keturba and his wife Val, welcome to this amazing Checkered Flag Museum uh, with all its wonderful cars and bikes. We've all been invited here by the Porsche Club of South Africa Central Region with the Sevilla Fenike Porsche Centre in Pretoria, the Han Marie and Sally Insurance Brokers. Right, our first guest is George Fischi, a real all-round sportsman. He's now 55, I can't believe that. But he's had a lot of adventures in his life. He's not only raced cars here in South Africa in the various formulas, raced Le Mans 14 times at Le Mans. Must be, well, it's certainly the most of South African has raced ever at Le Mans, but it is right up there with the top people who've ever raced at Le Mans. Some have gone up to 20. And he's raced in Japan many, many times at Fuji Race Race Suzuki and some of the other circuits there. Nice to have you here, George. Thanks very much. First of all, lo local racing, I mean, Sasko, West Bank V8 racing, you do it all, though. Yeah, you know, you uh, you do what you can at the times, and uh, the 80s were wonderful times. You know. I think I have always called it the golden era of our motorsport. I mean, names like yourself and all the other guys. But what actually, what actually got you into motorsport, George? I went to a Grand Prix in the 70s, and when just sitting down at Clubhouse, the old Clubhouse, I just looked at this and said, well, I want to be one of them, you know. That's my man. And, Wasn't uh, encouragement from your father? Pete, no, Because no. he was always at the motor race. I remember seeing him. He, he, him he, he, he supported me, um, but never forced me into doing it. Really? He, would, he would stand on the side and leave me alone to do my own thing, which was, which was great. You yeah. know, that's, you know, you see, you see so much difference between that and, and the karting world where the fathers get too involved. Oh, and, don't they? And, and the mothers. And the mothers. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it, it, from my side, it was totally opposite. Well, so, just, it was, so you're really a self-taught guy. Listen, at six you had, or six or eight, you always around your father's brick. You had a bit of an adventure there. I was a bit of a hooligan. <laughs> you kidding. You know, I'd, uh, if there was a bulldozer to be driven, I would drive it. Uh, tractor, what, whatever had a wheel and, and four, uh, a steering wheel and four wheels, I would, I would try and do it. At so. And that was my ambition then, was to try and drive as many things as possible. You know, I would drive trucks around the factory. Or, and yeah, uh, at the age of eight, unfortunately, I had a tractor accident. What happened there? I was teaching somebody to drive a tractor. I was sitting in the mud guard, slipped off in front of the rear wheel and it just ran over my head. And at eight years old? At eight years old, giving me this scar. <laughs> just let's have another look at it. It's not so bad now, no, no, but I remember it, seeing it, it's, you earlier, it went right around yes, your head. No, it's, it's recovered well over the last 45 years or whatever it is. Unbelievable, huh? Okay, just see some of the formulas that you drove here in South Africa, as you can remember. I mean, the West Bank V8s, the, the uh, Formula Atlantics, you into single seaters, into big saloon cars. Group one, group A, and you did it all back. Formula Fords? Uh, I, I did a bit of Formula Ford, but I was then told that I was too young to do it. I did, I did one qualifying session at Carl Army, I think I qualified sixth. Yeah. And that obviously pushed a few people off, and they asked me for my license, and I showed them, and they said, no, 18 years old is when you. I mean, those are those days. I mean, these days the kids are running at 14 years old. Oh, no, sure. Course. We've got them down in karting now, six and mm. seven. No, it's all, all kosher now. But listen, George, just, and then after you finished your racing career, we're going to that whole thing where you went, because you did travel and you did race. Uh, Formula One came to Power Bus. What got you into Power Bus? That was the days of Peter Lindenberg. And Correct. Um, Peter, Peter came around to my house in East London for a buy. And uh, I just got chatting to him, asked him when, when the next powerboat race, Formula One powerboat race, is going to be in East London. He said, funny enough, in two weeks' time. And he said, would you like to have a run in one? And I'd had a couple of brandies, you know, so, yes, <laughs> you know, sure, sure, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and, you know, that, that weekend went by, and the Monday morning he phoned me and said, uh, were you serious about yesterday? So obviously my ego said yes. And, of course. And I thought it would be a once-off event, a PR event for us. 
at that time I stayed in East London, so it was it was good for a local to be in a Formula One powerboat. Yeah. Gave the newspapers something to write about and, and bring a big crowd. So I, I, I assumed it was just a PR event. Had a good run actually, I finished fifth overall for the day. And what did you think of the powerboats? Because those powerboats could go. Eh? And the biggest thing about them, there must have been fairly heavy G-forces going around oh, the, the G boys. The, look, the G-forces are, are unbelievable. You know, you, you, can, you can do a 90 degree turn at 180 kilometers an hour, it just... And what does it do to you? Well, it, it, it's a fast, it's a fast snap G. So before you really know what's going on, it's done. Oh, and the acceleration from and north how to... Long do you do, how long did you power bowling for? I did uh, three years. Yes, that's so yeah. fantastic. Eh? But then my back started giving in because the power... Because of the power bowling. Pounding. Because oh, those motors, those big Mercury, Black Max, I think they call them. I can't. No, they were powerful motors. Those are the most powerful motors around. It was fantastic to see. Okay, George, they they thought you were too old for Formula Fords. But yeah, at 17 years old, there was George Fushi racing a car army in a Kramer Porsche. That does seem to get right. I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. At 17. Who's ever done that at 17? And what did, what did you think of the power of a big car like that? A Kramer Porsche. I mean, Kramer was so involved with Porsche all his years. Well, at, at first, it was not a problem. But because what I wasn't told and didn't realize that it had two accelerating points. Yeah. One was, and it had, it had a spring loading on these two accelerating points. So yeah. two phases. Yeah. First phase was no turbo, and it was a twin turbo. It still went quick enough, but well, it was about 300 horsepower for the first oh, just 300 for the yeah. first couple of laps, yeah. and I was going, yeah, this is not a problem. But for some reason, I remember coming out the second S, my my foot just pressed harder, which then took it to the next phase, and these bloody turbos kicked in, and it was like bang up to 650 horsepower. So I was like. For a 17-year-old, that like yeah. So that that uh, got my attention, but yeah, you know, it didn't take long to get used to it. But I mean, at Hall, it, it was a flat-bottom car, yeah. so I think Car Army we were quickest on the straight at 325. Quick. So yeah, it was a great. It was a good introduction for what you did afterwards. I mean, you. So, so what sort of sponsorship would you have needed in those days to go racing? Oh, a couple of grand. A couple of grand. You, you never get that today, boy. It's a couple it's, of grand. It's not possible. <laughs> and a big pucker racing car, is fantastic. Okay, listen, and also in this country, you also rallied a bit. I mean, you have really tried everything. And uh, with the, the great Bernie Mariner was part of your scene there. What did you rally? Uh, Bernie, yeah, great, great chap. Uh, I ran his Opal Cadet program. Yeah. Well, I didn't run it, I, yeah. I drove in it yeah. in the Group N uh, boss days. Yeah. And then he moved on Ford and took me with. No, I, I'm sorry. I then drove uh, Opal Rally Car from uh, Skona. Skona, which yeah, I destroyed yeah. in testing. Oh, well done. What did you do? Uh, just stupidity. Just but I mean, what did you hit? Did you roll or what did you do? I, I went off the road sideways. I, I came over a blind rise and there was a 90 right. Yeah. Tried to slow it down by putting it sideways. It, it, it got airborne when it hit the side of the road. And things were looking all right, except that in, in the bushes, they had cut down trees and there were these stumps. Wow. And, and one stump connected the rear wheel, which just then turned the car into a roller coaster. A rolling. That was Unbelievable, eh? Were you hurt in it? No, no, no. Of course not. Were you belted in? Did you have a helmet on? I was belted in, didn't have a helmet. It's not those days you didn't no, have I had, a helmet. I had a pair of dark glasses on, which I lost in, in the accident. Oh dear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I mean, he was a great guy, Bernie, with the railing thing. and. You were saying Sorrell's days as well. Okay, but 1984, you started going overseas. And you know, as we said, the 14, 13, 14 times at Le Mans, was that your first adventure overseas going to Le Mans? And that's high-speed stuff, eh? Um, my first race was in a Porsche 9 
5.6 at Silverstone. That's powerful stuff. And then from Silverstone, we went to Monza, which is a, is a high speed circuit. Yeah. And then from Monza, Le Mans was my third European race. And high speed in those days. We Milsons, just started... Milsons straight, 390. Uh, you know, the following, the following year, we were topping over 400, but that particular year, we, we ran for 18 hours in that race and then the rear suspension collapsed. Can you believe? On the Mulsanne, I just crossed the speed traps at 358. That's so a real high speed. Eh? So I just went from one barrier to the other. It just banged itself on both sides of the circuit. Fortunately, no, no sudden stop. But I think I banged the one side five, six times and the other side about there as well. And you came out of it unscathed? I got out of the car unscathed. But this was two o'clock in the morning and there was no marshal points, there was no light, so it's pitch dark in the forest. Walking away from the accident, there was a pole slightly higher than my crutch, which I walked into. And the uh, balls I did have were pretty painful at that. <laughs> but George, I mean, I remember Derek Bell telling me at night sitting on your own with this big Porsche engine or turbocharged Porsche twin turbo, whatever, uh, you're doing nearly 400 k's an hour, as you say. And he says that engine never, that Porsche engine never stopped accelerating. He says, geez. And, and he said the only thing that kept his foot flat is that they paid him to do mm. it. Otherwise, he'd have tapped off. It's just too good. <laughs> 400 no, k's an hour at night behind light. It's fantastic. And what did you think of the Lamar Sur? It was nice to race on. Because those are famous corners that you've got. It, it, it's a totally different race. The atmosphere, you know, you've got... 300,000 people there. It, it's a complete build-up. You know, we used to have a qualifying event in, in May. So, you know, although the race is in June, the, the whole build-up starts in May. You know, you go there, you qualify, you know, and there's 108 cars, 110 cars that come and qualify. Only oh. only 50, get in. 55 can start. So, you know, they get rid of the, the dregs that, <laughs> that can't, can't, get can't run the speeds and then yeah. you know that 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 whole month is just a psychological thing so of getting ready build up and then you've got the street parades and Funny. you know by the time the race comes you're exhausted <laughs> <laughs> what car are you driving the first time out uh 956 porsche yeah. it was the first year second year i think it was a 962. because i think the difference they've moved the driver back eh? They, they, they moved the, the the monocoque forward. It was a monocoque in Nancy. Yeah, they extended they extended the monocoque so the driver's feet would be behind the front axle line oh. for safety reasons. Yeah, so if you had a head on, it wouldn't break your legs. Would it? It's amazing stuff. Eh? I mean, the, the one was a, a cage and the other one was monocoque. I mean, those 962s were fantastic. And to me, they just looked like the long distance car. Oh, yes. When we had them out here, I think France Victoria's had one. They were just fantastic. Look, the, gra the great thing about <coughs> Porsche then was you as a customer could go and buy a 962 Porsche, take it to Le Mans, and have a, a bloody good chance of winning Winner. the race. There you go. You know, now, we if, need you, that again. now if, you're not, if you're not in a Toyota, you're finished. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's uh, yeah. It's unfortunate because... It's and you had the period with Audi, two same old family as Porsche, and they didn't they? They but just that, dominated, didn't they? But I mean, you had 20, 25 Porsche 962s on the grid. And you know, I think we had most of those at an hour in our race. We had, I think, about 18 or so. It was fantastic. You just took it for granted when you ran at a car long. You just thought, oh, we've got all these Porsches lined up. Here they go. And there were Ferraris and Lancias. That was a great no, it was. How much do you reckon you'd pay for a 962? More or less. What do you reckon those days? Uh, what to buy one? Yeah, um, they were about two hundred fifty thousand Deutschmarks, complete car. That's not too bad, eh? When you think today, you're not in a factory team. Good lord! And um, as I said, you could take that car, buy a few spare wheels, go to Le Mans, and, and have a good result. Good time, yeah. And is it and some of the South African partners that you had at Le Mans that drove with you? Uh, there was only two: it was Sara yeah. and Wayne Taylor. 
And Wayne, and and the positions you got, I think you were fifth overall with Sol and fourth overall with Wayne. That's he good. wasn't particularly mad about the speed when he first went to Lamar. I remember him saying, "That place is too quick for me." Says our Wayne Taylor's now won just about everything else going in sports cars. But the, uh, I mean, so you had experience with this, and then you also had Toyota. You raced there too and did very well in those as well. Class win, mm -hmm. pretty good going. So I mean. You had a good time. It's 14 times at the most. It's unbelievable. I had some good times there. Some sad times. You know, it's 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 oh, yeah. it's a very emotional race. So, you know, when things go well, you're happy. If things go bad, you know, you're unhappy. You're not so happy. Yeah. And it's a dangerous place. I mean, we've lost quite a few drivers yeah, there yeah. throughout my time, and and, and it, it's it's not a good feeling when you see somebody being killed. You know, it's, no, it, no, it, no. it takes and the atmosphere. Over it, the it, it takes it, but you know. 20 minutes later, you've, you've got a, you've forgotten yeah. about it until after the race. Yeah. These days, I think the circuit's a lot safer with run off oh, yeah. because the Formula One guys used to be killed at almost every race. I mean, you're hitting walls and barriers. Jackie Stewart to thank for that. But some of the other great names you've raced with, I know in Japan, you must have had Japanese drivers there. And there was also Stephen Anskov who shared cars with you a lot. I did a lot of, uh, a lot of time with him. I think we did about five seasons. And you all became buddies in that time. Yeah, we were close. And, and I think that that relationship helped the whole team get motivated. Yeah, you know, we, we, uh, there was no ego between him and I. It was, you know, if, you, if you're quick on the day, should you go for it. You know? Go for it, yeah. How, how long would you, uh, would you spend at, in one session? What were you out there for? Hour and a half, two hours, three hours? Uh, it all depended, you know. Fuel tank and all that. Lamar, less, what, Lamar, hours, Lamar hours? you could spend four hours in it. Uh, you easy. know, if so it's heavy concentration. If, if the weather is cool enough, and the time, you know, it, 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 a, a race like Lamar is is done on your feet. You, every every minute of it, you have to have somebody thinking on their feet because something can go wrong. Uh, and you know, you you, for example, you settled in the car at night. It's raining. Uh, you don't they want always to, have rain, eh? Uh, they seem to always have rain, I must say. But if you're sitting in the, uh, sitting in the car running it uh, in those conditions, why go and put a, a fresh driver in it? He, 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 hasn't, he hasn't been out at night yet oh. during the race. He doesn't know the condition. Oh. So just from a team's point of view, from a safety point of view, you know, you could run up to four hours and five minutes le legally. Those days, I don't know what it is now. Oh. So, yeah, some That's sessions up to four hours. Fantastic. It's a long time to concentrate heavily. I mean, you're going at such a speed in a place like that, as you say. Listen, the the um, then you also raced over in Japan. What made you go to Japan? Actually, it was opportunity. You know, Europe was becoming a bit tough. Uh, getting seats. Uh, ah. And uh, yeah, the opportunity came up with a Porsche team in Japan. Went over there for a test, and you know, I was employed. There you go. What drive cars you drive there? Uh, the first year was a nine five six. It's in Japan. They're running them there yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And then I think for about six years after that, the nine six two. So that's what you raced in Japan, it was Porsche again. I mean, you've been a Porsche man a long time. But listen, now some of the top names, I mean, you had, you've got to have had a Suzuki in there somewhere. He was a partner of yours, a name Suzuki. I think we, I had one teammate, but I think that was only for one race. It was only one race. And you had other great boats you drove, raced with in Japan. But uh, did you go and live in Japan there, George? Or did you, did you commute there? I commute. But, you know, I would spend, you know, if we, for instance, had two races that were three week weekends apart yeah. and I had a test program in between, yeah. then you stay there for that. So the, and, and, and the people themselves and yeah, language wonderful. was a wonderful people. Eh? Absolutely wonderful. And absolutely organised yeah. people. That's it. And you can go by what they say, that's for sure. But the, the, uh, the circuits you raced on were what? Uh, Fuji, obviously, uh, Suzuka, which is probably the greatest circuit in the world, in my opinion. Uh, Autopolis, uh, Sugo. Uh, yeah, that was about it. Yeah. That was but good. it was I mean, a, you know, a full-time. But they're mad on motorsport, the Japanese. Oh, the, the crowds. I mean, we used, 
I think 30% of our races were done in monsoons. And, and we had 120,000 people sitting there in monsoon weather. You know, They're their, not going to miss it. Their enthusiasm is no. just incredible. I remember going around Suzuka, I was at Honda at the time, I going around Suzuka circuit with a South African karting, a Western province karting champion, Johnny Besson, and we were in little Honda sports cars. And we should not have passed the man leading us with flags sticking out the window. So they chucked us off the circuit and said, you cannot race here anymore. And we were chucked off Suzuka because Suzuka okay. was a, it always has great mm -hmm. Grand Prix too. And Suzuka was owned by Honda, Fuji was owned by Toyota actually. So I mean, and there was a good old Fuji mount. It was fantastic oh, setting. Beautiful, beautiful setting. Very lovely. Oh, that is wonderful. Okay, and then listen, there was one of the things that you had there, George, commuting backwards and forwards. You had a narrow shave with South African Airway. Yeah, that uh, it took my breath away. I would say. You know, knowing knowing that that it happened, it was the Helderberg, and I was booked on it. And, yeah, I mean, there's really nothing to say about it. it uh, you must have got a shock, eh? Missed the flight, it was a typhoon, I think they yeah. cancelled the flight. Helberg route took off and of course it had that... Yeah, because my, my, my route back to South Africa was generally Tokyo, Taipei, Taipei, Johannesburg. And it was the Tokyo, Taipei route that, uh, that they were late on. It shatters you, eh? You've had a couple of close shakes, tractors over your head. But listen, also in... You just talking about your uh, time in uh, in Japan, you were sharing with Oscar. La no, he was a competitor of yours, Oscar Larari, and you'd come across him in a burning car. What happened there? Well, no, we were we were actually fighting for the lead, both both of us in, in and the championship. Um, you can tell us. I, I I the long the long part of the story is I lost the championship because of this. But we were fighting for the lead, both in 962 Porsches. And we would swap leads and, you know, it depends who came onto the long straight behind one another and you could retake because, I mean, the slipstream effect of those, those cars were huge. I bet. In this particular lap, I was behind him and coming out of the hairpin at Fuji, I, I saw bits of tyre start coming off his rear wheel. And there's a fast sweep to the right that, that's flat, and all of a sudden it just exploded. And he's, by that time I'd really come off the throttle. And he went and looped it uh, into the barriers, and it caught fire, and I stopped. I mean, it... it, it it's a natural thing you thought. It was a natural thing just to jump out, and, and he was unconscious. Oh, and what did you drag him out of the car? George, and what they do, they acknowledge you. They you lost uh, the championship, basically. Well, they, you know, at the end of the year, th that was the turning point where they said, you know, if you didn't do that, you would have won the championship. And, you know, it's, it's nothing I can do. And what with. did they award you for? I got a Heroes Award. I don't know what that means. Uh, but well, I, I think <laughs> a burning car getting a burning body out. A Hero Award from the Japan Auto Federation. I mean, they are very big in motorsport today. It's fantastic. Anyway, well done on that. But you also had your own little tire trouble at Fuji, or one of those other circuits. You were yeah. going pretty quick there too, eh? I had a, a huge shunt there, where a uh, yeah, tire basically came off the rim in qualifying. Straight into a wall, I think it was 88G impact. 88G, your own body weight. And what did it do? Uh, it, it screwed up my feet quite badly. He says modestly, like Rex, you're 280 k's is quick. I don't know if you've travelled at 280 k's, but it's quick. Things are happening very quick. And anyway, what happened to you? Did you get in crutches? What did you do? Well, initially I walked away from him, uh, from pure adrenaline. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as the adrenaline starts wearing off, you start realising there's something wrong. Okay. You know, and, and oh, two hours later, three hours later, I couldn't walk. Sure. <laughs> so, it didn't break the feet, it palpitated them. Unbelievable. That's a scary thing, eh? and it can happen so quick. Well, it, it happened on the telemetry from when when the tyre came off the run to impact was 0.7 of a second. One minute you're travelling, well, next thing you're in a huge accident. 
I tell you, you have lived through it. Listen, there was also a time, I mean, we just, we've been talking, we'll go back to talking sports cars where you went to America, but you also tested a, uh, a Sassel-sponsored uh, Jordan. One yeah, of Eddie I, Jordan's yes. cars at Silverstone. Yeah, I had the opportunity to go and test and, this And one. you could fit, because always it seems you have midgets driving in Formula 1 cars. They're always little short guys, lightweight, so they can fit in the car. They don't really well, the, the care about The car I tested was Terry Bootson's car, and Terry is quite a tall fellow. Oh, that's good. And how do you like it? Oh, I love driving it. it was, what's the difference between a world sports car and a Formula 1? Just the braking. The acceleration, a sports car... At, at that precise time, actually had more acceleration. You know, we, we were pumping over a thousand horsepower on those sports cars. <laughs> was that just for qualifying or for the race? Uh, uh, for qualifying, 1,400 horsepower. Uh, of course. 1,400 horsepower of old size engine. 2.73. 3.6 3, 3. twin turbo. Litre twin turbo. Oh, anyway, the Formula One, what happened with that test then? It was a great test. I mean, you were happy, quick. I was happy, I was quick. It's amazing. Uh, engineers were happy, but you know, Formula One is a strange business and. Uh, more political, I think, would you not say? You know, and uh, Eddie Irvine was there looking at the same deal, and, uh, and I think. And sponsorship, okay. I, I think that uh, Eddie bought some bank money from. I think with Eddie Irvine being an Irishman and Eddie Jordan an Irishman. I know them fairly well, haven't been born there, but I think they wanted to keep together, you know, so it's a pity, eh? Would you have liked to have changed it? Oh, of course, I mean, that was my ambition to get a Grand Prix. Still is unreal, eh? You know, I mean, I think anyone that drives a race car and, and does it properly, it's an ambition to get in there. The uniform, right? Things happen quickly, as you say. Take your foot of those, those uh, ground effects, etc. set you in the wings, they reckon it's like hitting a wall. And I was fortunate, those days, those cars, were the proper active suspension, uh, traction control. I mean, they had all the, the trick, uh, I wanted to say something, but all the tricks in them. <laughs> and then they started banding, you know, traction yeah, control. Exactly. And, and they reckon early days, I think it was around those days, Formula One about two pages of rules. And now they've got about two volumes of rules. I mean, it's got ridiculous, I think. It's got so technical. But those, a driver had more input into setting the car up and racing. But they were great days. View. I know they're fantastic. Listen, George, now just the other thing, the IMSA series now in America, now you've done Japan, you've been in Europe, now you're in America, the IMSA series, with our Wayne Taylor. I mean, there you're going again with Wayne. Well, I, I only did, and in fact, I didn't do the race with him. This was the first race, was the Miami Grand Prix. Yeah. It was the first race after my accident. And... I was still in crutches when I arrived at the circuit. You're kidding. And, and Wayne said to me, Wayne controlled the team then and said, listen, go and try it for a few laps. You just be honest and tell me if you can. And I just couldn't. I mean, the clutch, I didn't have the power in But my... did you need to get in psychologically? No, or no, so no, no, that no, you could no, do? no, it was physical. I, I physically didn't have the strength in my, my feet. To drive it? To drive, you know, the clutch pedal. I mean, you don't realise how how stiff a clutch pedal it is, is until you or can't how use. hard you have to jump on the brakes until you have no power no to do power it. Power to do it, yeah. And I did a few laps around the Miami circuit and just said, you know what, it's not. Cool as that. There's no ways. Oh. So yeah. What that, is that in a shave? That was in a. Because he used to do intrepid, in intrepid shed. Intrepid shed. Yeah, you know, it was a big seven liter, and I mean, it had ground effect. Oh, it. it Probably was the most ground effect car in in Group C or in, in yeah. IMSA then. That's unbelievable. Listen, the other time you went is uh, in '94 after our boys had also won Daytona. You went to go and do Daytona with some South Africans with mm. you. Who did you have? That was uh, Hilton Cowie and Stephen Watson. And they were top boys here. Yeah, right? they were was, quick, it was. Quick. It was a and how did you get on with that? It was a fun weekend until uh, we lost the cam belt. Cam belt was in the motor. And it was 10 o'clock the following morning, the Sunday morning. And so is that a challenging race with the banking and infield and all that type of thing? Um, it's different. Uh, it's not as challenging as a place like Lamar because it's, it, there's a lot of light around Daytona. Oh. You know, at Lamar you've got light basically in the pit straight. The rest is all in forests. 
Yeah. So, you know, if the car doesn't it's have... into the, the yeah, light. So, yeah. so if you don't have proper lights on, on the race car, and, yeah. and for some reason, engineers always forgot decent lights. Yeah, but you're only the driver. I know. I mean, what do you no. need for? Just cope. Put you, put you in a seat that's uncomfortable and don't give you lights. I and mean, no space. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they'll fight like hell to get that extra horsepower out of the, out of the engine. So. But you know, since those days, I mean, the 90s, Wayne Taylor was there. It, today, the team, and they've done very well, these two boys r r racing there, they're in the Penske team. There's Penske, Wayne Taylor, Chip Ganassi, I think, and those are about the team, and the Hendrix Motorsport team. If you're not in one of those teams, I mean, you're not, you're not around. No, look, he's, he's built a, a great career over there, and yeah. I, I'll go over to And he's never changed. Well, no, he's never no. changed. Same guy he was, yeah. But I was, just to go back on Daytona, I thought with the banking, You'd feel either being pushed down. Well, you, you do. Oh, you do. You do. That. Yeah, because yeah, you're going at a big not, speed it's not, there it's not too. A lateral G. Oh, no, because it's pushing you down, sort of pushing your chin into your. Which is great. I mean, you just feel like you're going faster than you should be. Yeah. Oh, but they do fly there. That's unbelievable. Okay, well, that's uh, that's fantastic. Now, George, then you came back and, as you said, you did the thing. Just before, I want to just talk about what you're doing these days. The group in racing. I remember you raced. Uh, we had a. Alpha 3 litre V6, uh, which Darby de Villiers also, he was big in racing. He's still Alpha, I mean, he, uh, with the Glenwood cars and that, and the Opel Gadicio. What did you think of that 3 litre V6? Well, at that time, I mean, we started with a 2.5, and yeah. obviously going to the 3 litre, you... Had a wonderful sound, too. Oh, it, it, and and a, a very exciting car to drive, you know. You never really knew which direction you wanted to be in. <laughs> but that, that was probably my driving style as well. Yeah, that suited you, eh? Handling the foot. But what a lot of people don't know is that the bonnet was given a scoop mm -hmm. and there was a different air dam in the front. And that was all designed and built by Andrew Thompson, who's very big into Formula 4s. He did it through his right, fiberglass. Right. He used to do those things for trucks with aerodynamics. Okay, now since you've been back, and of course your wife Sonia is very close to you, you've taken up flying. So there's another product. Are you still flying today? Yes, In a what plane? Uh, Jabiru. Jabiru, nice, eh? I, I used to fly in the the 80s, uh, uh, in the 90s. What did you fly? Uh, Cherokee 6, Piper Cherokee So I, I did fly to races. A bit of a difference with the Jabiru, right? Eh? Well, the Jabiru is just, uh, it's smaller, it's oh. just myself and my wife. It's wonderful. Where do you fly to? Wherever we feel. But you mean right around South Africa? At the moment, no, we just uh, go for an hour's flip somewhere. Over and where do you no. station it? Nigeria? Uh, no, at uh, Rhino Park. At Rhino Park, yeah, you know, that's a very active place now. Because, and then you also had some experience in the simulators for the 737 and Airbus. What's that like? Yeah, that's great. Would you have liked to have been a commercial pilot? Um, at this present time, no. No. But in those days, <laughs> you ever want to be a pilot? Um, no, I, I, I don't think I'd have the patience to do all the commercial paperwork. And, and that you've got to do. But I, I do love my flying. And, oh. and you know, it's, it's like anything in life. Uh, it's like racing cars. I was a professional and you get, to, you get to a stage in your life where you go, you know what, I'm, I'm now tired of this. Yeah, yeah. Time to pack it up. People wish they were me in that situation. And, uh. and I suppose it's the same as flying. You know, commercial pilots are going, put on the autopilot and you know, we're flying. And I'm not enjoying it as much as flying the small air. Yeah, which is even more hands on to the whole thing. To me, it, it's just fun. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, Can you get air sick in a simulator? Oh, yeah. The ones I've flown. No, well, they, Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. In a simulator? You know, well, they, the... they're full motion. Oh, yeah, no, sure. So, you know, if you do hit turbulence, you, you, you... Well, you'll be happy to know the 737X is allowed back in the air now. So, oh, you can try that, George. Be the first. I'll, I'll, I'll wait. You give a no, I'll, for I, think I, I think I'm running out of chances in my life. <laughs> no, you've done well. 55 years old now. You've had a great life and, and you've really organised it for yourself. You've travelled the world, met a lot of people. And well done. It's been lovely talking, George. That your experiences that South Africans from little old South Africa have gone out there and carried the flags with that. So no, it's, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride. So let's hope it continues for you, George. Thanks very Thanks much. Lovely that. talking to you. That was George Fisher. You can hear he's had a great life driving sports cars and Formula Ones and flying aircraft has been fantastic, uh, all from little South Africa.